Am I the only guy in this country who's fed up with what's happening? Where the hell is our outrage? We should be screaming bloody murder. We've got a gang of clueless bozos staring our ship of state right over a cliff. We've got corporate gangsters stealing us blind, and we can't even clean up after a hurricane, much less build a hybrid car. But instead of getting mad, everyone sits around and nods their heads when the politicians say, stay the course. Stay the course? You've got to be kidding. This is America, not the damn Titanic. I'll give you a soundbite. Throw the bums out. You might think I'm getting senile, that I've gone off by rocker, and maybe I have. But someone has to speak up. I hardly recognize this country anymore. The President of the United States has given a free pass to ignore the Constitution, tap our phones, and lead us to war on a pack of lies. Congress responds to record deficits by passing a huge tax cut for the wealthy. Thanks, but I don't need it. The most famous business leaders are not the innovators, but the guys in handcuffs. While we're fiddling in Iraq, the Middle East is burning, and nobody seems to know what to do. And the press is waving pom-poms instead of asking hard questions. That's not the promise of America my parents and yours traveled across the ocean for. I've had enough. How about you? I'll go a step further. You can't call yourself a patriot if you're not outraged. This is a fight I'm ready and willing to have. My friends tell me to calm down. They say, leave. You're 82 years old. Leave the rage to the young people. Well, I'd love to, as soon as I can pry them away from their iPods for five seconds for them to pay attention. I'm going to speak up because it's my patriotic duty. Hey. America, wake up. These guys work for us. Why are we in this mess? How did we end up with this crowd in Washington? Well, we voted for them, or at least some of us did. But I tell you what we didn't do. We didn't agree to suspend the Constitution. We didn't agree to stop asking questions or demanding answers. Some of us are sick and tired of people who call free speech treason. Where I come from, that's dictatorship, not democracy. George W. Bush brags about never reading a newspaper. I just scan the headlines, he says. I am I hearing this right? He's the president of the United States and he never reads a newspaper? A leader must have courage. I'm talking about balls. That even goes for female leaders. Swagger isn't courage. Tough talk isn't courage. George Bush comes from a blue-blooded Connecticut family, but he likes to talk like a cowboy. You know, my gun is bigger than your gun. He even told an interviewer that the high point of his presidency so far was catching a seven and a half pound perch in his hand-stocked lake. I think our current president should visit the real world once in a while. He prides himself on being faith-based, not reality-based. Now, if that doesn't scare the crap out of you, I don't know what will. On September 11th, 2001, we needed a strong leader more than any other time in our history. We needed a steady hand to guide us out of the ashes. Where was George Bush? He was reading a story about pet goats to kids in Florida when he heard about the attacks. He kept sitting there for 20 minutes with a, a, a baffled look on his face. So, here's where we stand. 
We're immersed in a bloody war with no plan for winning and no plan for leaving. We're running the biggest deficit in the history of the country. We're losing the manufacturing edge to Asia, while our once great companies are getting slaughtered by health care costs. Gas prices are skyrocketing, and nobody in power has a coherent energy policy. Our schools are in trouble. Our borders are like sieves. The middle class is being squeezed every which way, and these are times that cry out for leadership. When you look around, you've got to ask, where have all the leaders gone? Name me a leader who has a better idea for homeland security than making us take off our shoes in the airports and throw away our shampoo. Name me one leader who emerged from the crisis of Hurricane Katrina. Everyone's hunkering down, fingers crossed, hoping it doesn't happen again. Now that's just crazy. Storms happen, deal with it. Name me an industry leader who's thinking creatively about how we can restore our competitive edge in manufacturing. Who would have believed that there could ever be a time when the big three referred to Japanese car companies? Name me a government leader who can articulate a plan for paying down the debt or solving the energy crisis or managing the health care problem. The silence is deafening. I have news for the gang in Congress. We didn't elect you to sit on your asses and do nothing and remain silent while our democracy is being hijacked and our greatness is being replaced with a mediocrity. What is everybody so afraid of? Why don't you guys show me some spine for a change? Hey. Hey, hey, I'm not trying to be the voice of gloom and doom here. I'm trying to light a fire. I'm speaking out because I have hope. I believe in America. If I've learned one thing, it's this. You don't get anywhere by standing on the sidelines waiting for somebody else to take action. Whether it's building a better car or building a better future for our children, we all have a role to play. That's the challenge I'm raising. It's a call to action for people who, like me, believe in America. It's not too late, but it's getting pretty close. So let's shake off the horse shit and go to work. Let's tell them all we've had enough. Ladies and gentlemen, Patty Hagan. If Ratner builds it, they will come. But we noticed that Ratner wanted to build it with our money. Well, hell no. No Nets, no Geary, no Miss Brooklyn and her unsightly brood. It's our $2 billion that Ratner wants. It's our homes. It's our livelihoods. It's our neighborhoods. It's our borough. It's our low-rise Brooklyn skyline. It's our sunshine, it's our famous sunsets, it's our big sky. That is what this day is all about, a day we knew would come. We drew up a petition and took it to the streets. It may seem hard to believe, but three years ago, our opening line was, have you heard about the arena Ratner wants to build at Atlantic and Flatbush? Most people hadn't, and most people didn't believe it. Next, we said, and he's going to use eminent domain. Get the government to take your house to get you out of his way. Invariably, the neighbor's reply was, he can't do that. Hey, you cut me off already. I haven't really got militant like I want to be yet. Glad to be here. My name is Ed Carter. From time to time, they call me the legend of Fort Greene. Not because I didn't earn it, because I've been involved from the cradle to the grave in Brooklyn. I grew up in Brooklyn in the section of Bensonhurst, moved in the military to serve in Korea, from Korea to Vietnam, where I served 30 years. When I came back to Brooklyn, my beloved Brooklyn, I wound up, wait a minute, hold on here. Did I hear a crop dust and airplane fly overhead, anybody? 
Anybody here? Know why I'm saying that? Those damn developers are like the crop dusters when they're throwing out things for the insects. If you look overhead, you may see some airplane flying over, throwing out dollar bills to buy you off. You can't buy me off. I'm a militant. And I take a great deal of pride in saying I'm a militant. I fought the fort. I was with Martin Luther King on the Poor People's March. I paid my dues down in Brooklyn. I had community. I'm neither running for nothing. I'm not running for dog catcher, nothing. I paid my dues. I don't need to be begging and borrowing and kissing everybody's hind side to get elected or nothing else. Because I paid my dues and I earned it. And those of us who down here earned it, we need a fair share. We've seen those developers come out and buy preachers, teachers, and everybody else. Stormed in the neighborhood with their money. Why do you think I got this big cowboy hat on? That's like the cattle baron. They run their cattle to our community, and if you don't watch Brooklyn, they're going to saw it off and we're going to go out into the Atlantic Ocean, and they would have been brought everything up, everything that don't grow, everything that don't grow in our community, and I'm damn well fired up with it. You've heard all the elected officials give you their spiel. You've heard all of the other people give you their spiel. Why am I supporting this group? Why? Because they're the underdogs. They don't have the money to fight some of those big tycoons, some of those big developers who have sold us out for years and years on edge. Put me off the stage if you want to. Give me time out. Kick me the hell out of here. I don't mind. My lips is too so my lips are too sore to kiss any politician's hindsight to get anything done. None of them. None of them. From the governor to the mayor on down the line. I paid my dues. And I'm saying to you, I support this group because they're the little people. They're the underdogs. How the hell do the, the developers take the right to move people out of the houses? To move people from their locations where they lived and earned for years. I fought in Korea, and I fought in Vietnam, and I seen my buddies die, and I was injured in there too. When I come back home, I, I believe we earned this. This is our land, and we've seen how so many other places have been sold out to the different developers and the different people with the money. That green stuff will buy your mama if you don't watch it. Don't let me talk anymore. Put me off this. Kick me out. I've been kicked out of better places. Thank you. God bless you. Ed Carter, ladies and gentlemen, and our state senator, Belvin and Montgomery. There's another war. There's not just the war in Iraq. There's not just the war on terror. There's a war we are definitely losing, and that's the class war. Then against us. What's happening in Prospect Heights and Fort Greene is just one of the battle, battle lines. It's also happening in Greenpoint. It's also happening in the Bronx, and it's also happening in Queens. And this next speaker has been fighting alongside Letitia James and Charles Barron from the very beginning. From Queens, he chairs the zoning, uh, zoning committee, Councilman Tony Avella. Thanks a lot. This is a great turnout today in the heat. I'm happy that you're all staying here because this is the beginning of a citywide battle. We have to stop saying no to overdevelopment and yes to people power. It's about time that the city of New York, city government, pay attention to what you and I want for our own block and not what the developers want. And I know I don't have to tell you, I know I'm preaching to the choir here today, but the real estate industry in this city rules. What the real estate industry wants, they get. What you and I want, we don't get. It has to change. I've been happy to stand together with my colleagues in the city council, Charles Barron, Letitia James, in opposing this project. As chairman of the zoning committee, I will continue to do that. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, I'm not going to have a vote as chairman of the city council of the zoning committee because it's not going through the land use process. That's one of the things that has to change. Real community-based planning has to come about, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to introduce legislation that I've been developing with the Municipal Arts Society 
that will revolutionize planning in this city so that you determine what happens in your own neighborhood. And I'm going to push for that with my colleagues. And if we don't get it done, I'm going to finish with this. I intend to make this a citywide issue in 2009 because I'm going to run for mayor in 2009. And we're going to change this policy. Good luck. We're going to win. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Keep it going. I just want to say that a person born and bred in Brooklyn a person born and bred without a lot of bread. It is an insult to people of poor, of the poor. Everyone thinks that just because you have, uh, are of low income, that you don't have any money, that you're stupid. This plan insults the poor, not only everyone else, but it insults the poor. And we deserve better. The lies and the propaganda has to stop. Rosie, were you born in Brooklyn? I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, my birth certificate actually says I'm a Brooklyn comma Queens. I was also born uh, right here in Brooklyn, not right here, but in East New York. East Brooklyn. New York, that's gangster out <laughs> yeah. there. Oh, who would have thought? I live close by, a few blocks away now for the last 15 years. And I love Brooklyn. And um, I, I eat, sleep, live, and drink Brooklyn. Mostly drink <laughs> Brooklyn lager. No, 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 not Brooklyn lager. What's the good one? Are you tired of your Brooklyn home or business? Yes, I am. I sure am sick of my store. And do you like to drink beer? Beer is great. Well. Now you can have it all at once. That's right, drink delicious Brooklyn Lager. The beer that throws you out of your home and into the streets and into the sewers. Wow, that's great. Uh, I think. Yeah, what? That's right, Brooklyn Lager. It's the only beer that supports eminent domain to close down your businesses and take your home and property and give it to multi-billionaire Bruce Ratner. That's right. Here's how it works, folks. Simply drink Brooklyn Lager beer until you pass out. I'm pretty buzzed now. Uh, right, customers? Really drunk. Government agents will come to your house when you're asleep and you're knocked out and throw all of your stuff and you out on the streets. That's right. And they'll give your stuff, your property, your business to multi-billionaire Bruce Ratner. What? That's Brooklyn Lager is the supposedly Brooklyn beer that's announced its support for the Ratner Arena, the place that can only be built if you get drunk enough to let the government seize your home and businesses and give it to Bruce. While Brooklyn Lager says it doesn't have an opinion on the Atlantic seizure site, they are certainly and absolutely in favor of the Nets moving to Brooklyn. That's right. And guess where the Nets are going to move? The shop? <laughs> My home? In Bruce Ratner's newest property, your home or business. That's right. Wow, I'm homeless now. Thanks to those bastards in Brooklyn Lager. Why are they close my store and give it to a billionaire? Because you were totally f***ing drunk on delicious Brooklyn Lager beer. The beer that wants to give your home and business to a billionaire. I'll never drink those sick people's beer again. I miss my store. My home? Oh no! Why didn't I drink a beer from a company that doesn't support giving my home to a rich prick? Brooklyn Beer. Give Ratner your home or business and then drink the beer that made Brooklyn into a giant hotel room and shoddy stadium. Remember, homes suck. So suck down a Brooklyn lager and we'll see you on the streets and in the sewers.
As my fellow Brooklynite, Allen Ginsberg said, the soul should never die ungodly in an armed madhouse. So here it is. This is the new armed madhouse from Baghdad to New Orleans to Brooklyn. Sordid secrets and strange tales of a White House gone wild. Read it. I know where you live and I know where your kids go to school. We got someone who's going to lay down the law for you. He's an activist, an entrepreneur, proprietor of Bob Law's Seafood Cafe and the Moscow Health Store right here on Vanderbilt. And when he's not, uh, when he's not building his own empire over there on Vanderbilt Avenue, he's also the DDB advisory board. Ladies and gentlemen, the man's going to lay down the law for you right now, Bob Law. I am pleased to be here. And I am pleased to see so many of you here. The issue here that I want people to be really clear about, understand why we are here, why we oppose Ratna. It, we don't oppose developing anything, but we oppose the process by which Ratna is trying to recreate how the city operates so that the people who live in the community are stripped of their own power. Charles and I belong to an organization back in the 60s. You know, y'all probably never heard of this organization, but we had a slogan back then that said, power to the people. I know it was a long time ago. Y'all don't remember that organization, but we used to try to make it clear that what was essential for the stability of a community was that the people who lived in that community had control over their own destiny. This fight here is a fight around power. It is not just a question of development, it is a question of power. I support power for the people. I believe that we were correct back in the 60s and 70s when we said power to the people. Since we stopped saying it, then the power brokers began to systematically strip the people of their power and particularly here in New York City, as the city council becomes more black and brown, then major developers try to find a way that they can circumvent that black and brown presence on the city council and invent a new way of doing business that allows them to do business as a result of the collusion they enter into with the mayor and the governor and the borough president and whoever else they can buy. You know that the people who support Ratna have supported anything Ratna says. They don't question it. As changes occur in this development, the changes occur because of the questions that you have raised. Anything you say, Ratna tries to respond. The supporters accept anything he says. If he says it's going to be 40 stories tall, they say, yes, sir, boss. If you put pressure on and he says, okay, now it's going to be 30 stories tall, they say, okay, boss. Anything he says, they say yes. He said, how about money? <laughs> they can't change their position, no matter how correct we are, because they have already taken the money. The power has to be in the hands of the people. Y'all need to be clear that the fight is a fight for who controls the rest of your life? Who controls our destiny? They say that it is about Brooklyn. I don't know how many folk here were born and raised in Brooklyn. I was born and raised right up the street on Bergen Street and Buffalo Avenue, right here in Brooklyn. Been in Brooklyn all of my life. I'm, I, I am indeed concerned about Brooklyn. I'm concerned about communities like Brooklyn all over the country. I want you to be clear. When people say that we are opposed to jobs, let me tell you this. I am. These jobs that Ratten is talking about, these temporary dead-end jobs, I am opposed to that. I come from a community that needs careers, not just temporary dead-end jobs. And I'm offended. Listen. I'm offended by people who come among us saying that unemployment is so high in the black community that any job is of value. Under their watch, under their leadership, unemployment is so high in the black community 
it seems to me that that's an indictment of them. How is it possible that unemployment can be so high in the black community under their leadership? And then they use the failures of their leadership to suggest that we should accept meaningless, dead-end, temporary jobs as the benefit that the community gets from Ratner building this development where he becomes even wealthier and earns more and more billions. How can somebody come to poor people and say, we want you to support the wealthy billionaire as he becomes even wealthier, and what you get is a temporary dead-end job, and that is sufficient. Anybody who tells you that is somebody who really has contempt for you. Anybody who tries to sell you those dead-end jobs as a benefit is somebody who doesn't respect you at all. Affordable housing. Affordable housing. When St. Mary's Hospital up here in the hood where I grew up closed, Ratner said that he wanted to buy it. Y'all remember that? What he wanted to put on there was housing because he said that's where the affordable housing would go. He then went on to say that he never said that the affordable housing was going to be on site. See, all of these poor folk thought that they were going to get a $100 a month apartment in a luxury condo with the millionaires downtown Brooklyn. So they embraced the idea. He never, he went on to say that he never told you that you were going to be able to live in that development. He simply said, that part of his plan was to create affordable housing. Where it'll be is still up to him. Even that is not up to you. And that's what happens when you let the developer develop the community benefits program by himself. Listen. I got, I got to go, listen. Here's the issue. It is an issue of power. Do you believe that you deserve to have power? in your own community. It is an issue of power. Don't start fighting over it's an issue of development or not. We've already made it clear that the development is ill-conceived. What we're talking about now is who has the power and who will maintain the power. We're talking about returning power to the people because the people have seen the power systematically stripped away by con games and con artists. We're talking about a return to the good old days, old time religion, power to the people. Power to the people. Listen, don't let this be the only issue that you organize around. See, my concern is some of y'all are going to go home and we'll never see you again once this struggle over this development. But since this development has brought you together, take advantage of that, make this a permanent movement, make this a larger organization, let this develop, don't destroy, become a significant organization, not a one-issue organization, and continue to fight for power to the people. Thank you.